So let me first start by um, welcoming everyone, and uh, let me invite uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Political Science at Jilangkorn University, Professor A. Uh, thanks, Abhatana, to uh, provide some welcome remarks at Jilangkorn Center. Um, Your Excellency, uh, Miss Inge Grigson Solidai, the Foreign Minister of Norway, Your Excellency, Dr. Kantati Supakongkorn, uh, former Foreign Minister of Thailand, and Your Excellency, Kun Kasit Pilong, also former Minister of Thailand. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. It is uh, my utmost pleasure to welcome you to ISIS uh, Public Forum on Multilateralism, No More, Question Mark, uh, The Future of World Order from Europe to Asia. I would like to inform our overseas guests who have not been on this campus before that we are sitting uh, in the oldest and original bu building of Jualongkot University, which dates back more than 100 years. So I hope you like the atmosphere and the history of uh, what we can offer uh, for you on campus. Second, to introduce our subject this morning, I think it had become common knowledge that the rule based liberal international order that was set up after the Second World War is now undergoing stress and strain. We are watching the rivalry and competition between the United States and China with growing concern. Tension in the South China Sea has posed an existential challenge to ASEAN unity and centrality. China's Belt and Road Initiative, on the one hand, and the US-led Indo-Pacific strategy on the other, are putting pressure on Southeast Asian states to choose. And no one wants to choose what is comes to the US and China. Event relations between South Korea and Japan have soured recently. As a result, what used to be the accepted rules and norms in the international system are increasing, contested, and contentious. Multilateralism is not working for us like the way it used to. In fact, Multilateral cooperation among the states and government is at low point. Wide, regional, bilateral, and even unilateral behavior among states is more common now than we can remember. The world trading system, for example, is at severe risk, as multilateral negotiations have been ineffective. Global financial governance in view of technological innovation is similarly challenged. This public forum address these issues and challenges. We will start with keynote address by Norwegian Foreign Minister in the election Solidarity, who would then join the panel discussion with two uh, Thai Foreign Minister, uh, His Majesty Dr. Kantati and uh, His Excellency uh, Kun Kasi. On behalf of the Faculty of Political Science, I thank uh, the three current and former ministers deeply and sincerely uh, for making time to share their experiences and expertise uh, this morning. Finally, uh, let me say that allow this morning we are facing tough uh, competition for audience participation. There is an ASEAN week on, on campus uh, in the lead up to ASEAN birthday on 8th August. And there are also a host of high level meeting of the public discussion around the town this week in conjunction with the ASEAN ministerial meetings. So I take note of our strong audience uh, turnout today. And I thank everyone for being here today. Uh, for what I am sure that uh, it will be a stimulating uh, discussion uh, on the future of the uh, global order. Thank you. So, Minister, um, uh, before you come up, uh, 
I'll just say you have the, the bios of the speakers, of the discussions, and also the, the minister with you, so I won't go into all the details. But I'll just say uh, what strikes me uh, from the bio of the foreign minister of Norway, and uh, please excuse us if we pronounce your name a little bit uh, off the mark. Um, um, Ms. Uh, Ine uh, Eriksson uh, Soida. Soida. Um, what, what strikes me from, from your bio is that uh, you're a very young minister, not just a minister of foreign affairs, but prior to being foreign minister, she was the minister of defense uh, for, for several years. And she joined the uh, Conservative Party of Norway at a very young age, only 24. She was on the central committee of the, of the party. So a very young minister, I think this is a 21st century phenomenon. Uh, in Thailand, uh, we haven't caught that phenomenon yet, uh, but we hope to, to, to follow in the footsteps of the countries who have a new generation, younger, fresher, brighter uh, faces and minds to run their countries. Um, also, I would say that multilateralism as a kind of a, a prompt uh, is having a challenging days ahead and yeah, having a hard time. Uh, in fact, uh, this, this week there's a lot of uh, bilateral meetings, but also some, some multilaterals. Uh, the trend has not been promising. We are seeing more unilateralism manifesting in protectionism, trade protectionism. We're seeing more bilateral FTAs, bilateralism, transactional uh, approaches to uh, foreign policy. Uh, this is a, a bad omen for um, multilateralism, the system that we've had over the last seven decades. Uh, multilateralism, in general, uh, implies cooperation among three plus, uh, you know, not just bilateral, but three, three or more countries, states, governments. Uh, but I would add to that, I think, uh, you know, multilateralism is not uh, just three plus, uh, it, it also is, uh, is multi-regional. You know, we have ASEAN. ASEAN is an organization of uh, uh, 10 countries, but uh, we're seeing more Asia-centric and kind of a regionalistic regionalization without the broader international cooperation. This is also a, a another alarming trend. It's not that multilateralism is finished, but we're seeing multilateralism being confined to regions and to smaller neighborhoods, not to the international arena anymore. So uh, we highly anticipate your, your address as former uh, Minister of Defense and now Minister of Foreign Affairs. Please uh, uh, join me in welcoming to the stage of uh, former Minister of Norway, Ms. Ine uh, Eriksson Soida. Dear uh, Director Tikhanon and Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very grateful for the turnout we have here today. We had a, had a quick conversation with my Deputy Chief of Staff and, and we very quickly concluded that we were the lucky ones today because we have a police escort when traveling around town, so it was more or less easy for us to get here, or I would say more or less easy. Uh, but for the rest of you, it's uh, more of a job, it's more difficult, so we are very grateful for, for the big turnout. And I'm delighted to be here at the Institute of Security and International Studies and to have this opportunity to discuss a topic that is very close to my heart and also, I suppose, to the hearts of many uh, of you in the audience. The issue of multilateralism is not going to go away anytime soon. And unfortunately, I think that we are looking at it with a bit of a different mindset right now than we did 5, 10, 15 years ago. And I will try to get into some of the analysis uh, on that uh, shortly. But it is also uh, very nice, and I would say I feel very honored to be at a university which carries the name of a Thai king that came to Norway as early as 1907, uh, visited some Aida, uh, and as we all know by now, because we checked this and it's been a part of uh, our discussions here as well, on the new 100 bath bill, you will see the car of some Aida, uh, so it's a very good link uh, to, um, to Norway and between Norway and Thailand. As um, Director Titanan mentioned, the 
main reason for my visit here uh, this week is, of course, the ASEAN Foreign Ministers meeting. Uh, I have enjoyed participating as a guest of the chair, and we became a sectoral dialogue partner in 2015. And ever since that, we have had a thriving uh, cooperation between Norway and ASEAN in many different areas. We have a action plan consisting of nine different uh, points of action or topics which we work together on and we are constantly expanding the number of projects we are cooperating on. What we see and what is very interesting for us to experience is that we have very much in common with the ASEAN countries. We are open economies, all of us. Uh, we depend on international trade, we depend on common rules, and we also depend on respect for international law and uh, cooperation for our own security. So at the outset, this is a topic and an area that unites and, and joins forces between our countries. So in short, the rules-based international order where we compete by the same rules and uh, where right comes before might has benefited both the ASEAN countries and Norway for decades. However, in recent years, I would say that the international order has come under huge pressure. Uh, international politics have become much more unpredictable than it used to be. You can say a lot about the previous times and even about the Cold War. It has mostly, it had mostly uh, downsides, I would say, if not only. But at least it was in its own way predictable. You knew what the actors would do and would not do. Now it is not predictable anymore. There's more instability, there's greater unrest uh, in the international system. And as a response to these developments, um, the government of Norway just in June released a white paper on multilateralism. Um, as far as I know, as far as we know, it is the first of its kind. And we are trying to address Norway's role and interests in the multilateral system. It sets out a direction for Norway's multilateral policy in, in the years ahead. And I want to say that it takes a very realistic approach to this topic. In other words, we have as a starting point the world as it is, not as we wish it were. NATO as a defense alliance and a political alliance is that unless we are willing to commit and to risk our own soldiers' life and health in a certain situation, there would be no alliance. That's the basis of the alliance. And it can sound very harsh, very brutal, but that is the basis of the alliance. We risk uh, our own soldiers' life and health to defend each other. And that is exactly the core of international cooperation. We commit beyond our own self-interest. Because if we are not willing to do that, other countries are not willing to come to our rescue when we need it. The first challenge we point to in the white paper is the shift in the balance of power in the world, which have challenged much of the underlying conditions for international cooperation. One example is the strategic rivalry between China and the US. It could be protracted and it could have major consequences for the multilateral system. To make this point a bit more concrete, at least when I speak about this at home, I often illustrate it like this. Trade conflicts, they create economic uncertainty. That uncertainty makes it more difficult for a small company in rural Norway to make decisions on investments or whether or not to hire more staff. It's a very concrete expression of that global uncertainty that can sometimes be a bit abstract. This holds true for any company here in Thailand as well. We are affected of a um, I would say rhetorical war or discussion going on elsewhere. Secondly, some of the world's most powerful states are turning away from multilateralism. They're choosing to solve problems, just as Director Tijan said, bilaterally instead of multilaterally sometimes even choosing unilateral decisions or a transactional tit-for-tat approach. 
All of this makes it harder for a country like Norway to defend our interests. And based on the conversations I have with my colleagues, foreign ministers of the ASEAN region, it's exactly the same issue everyone is experiencing right now. The third point in the analysis is that the norms and the rules that are so fundamental to us are under pressure. In the UN and in other organizations, I experience that we spend almost more time defending what we have so far instead of taking brave new steps and, and kind of pushing the agenda forward. I had never thought I would spend so much time in trying to defend, for instance, language on sexual and reproductive health rights, as one example. A fourth challenge is the surge of populism and nationalism in many countries. And increasing inequality within countries have given rise to discontent with economic globalization and distrust in the institutions that have facilitated it. In the long run, this can harm the legitimacy of organizations like the UN and the WTO. The fifth point is that inefficiency and disappointing results and lack of representativeness is also diminishing trust in international in cooperation. Many organizations are functioning well, but reforms are also needed. And part of our agenda has to be willingness to reform. Multilateral organizations have to deliver effectively and adapt to a changing world. Otherwise, their relevance will decline very quickly. And that brings me to the sixth challenge. The multilateral system must be enabled to solve new challenges. Much of the system that we have today is not set up to address challenges like climate change, like new transnational security threats, or the issue of artificial intelligence. The reality is, however, that all the major challenges that our societies are facing today cannot be solved by one nation alone. It is impossible. They cross borders, they are too big, they are intertwined. It is absolutely impossible to think that one country can solve, for instance, the climate crisis. Yes, we all have to do our part, but we're unable to find the grand solution alone. That is why one of our key points in the part where it comes to solutions to this in the white paper is to work with these organizations from within, to reform them from within. I'm convinced, I'm deeply convinced, that international cooperation is the best way to promote our interests. So now, ladies and gentlemen, is not the time to give up on multilateralism or the multilateral system. So I'm hoping to answer the question multilateralism no more with no. <laughs> multilateralism is still going to be at the core of our foreign policy. Now is the time to defend it, to strengthen it, to work together. We are very keen to work together with solid partners on this and partners that have, have engagement, creativity, wisdom, pragmatism, and such partners we find among the ASEAN countries. And part of my mission here is to continue to strengthen these bonds and ties between our countries. The challenges that we're facing right now, it forces us to join efforts and also to focus our efforts. So our white paper suggests six priorities. First, we must defend our room for maneuver in foreign policy. When the global balance of power shifts, Norway's room for maneuver also changes, as it does to every country in this region. The return of great power politics on the international arena, of course, has consequences for medium-sized and small countries like our own. Norway's room for maneuver in foreign policy has always been a function of our ability to enter into strategic collaborations and alliances, always. We have to put more emphasis 
on upholding our positions both at home and abroad. And in foreign policy turmoil, as we may say that it is right now, our strength comes from being a clear and predictable actor in international relations and to nurture the close partnerships that we have with many countries already. Secondly, Norway can, but also must, be a driver of reform. We, of course, need to give priority to the most important uh, institutions and organizations that are the basis of our foreign policy, like the UN, like the WTO, like NATO. But in this day and age, we must defend what we have rather than trying to build new sets of organizations or, or new ways of organizing ourselves. That's not where we should use our uh, energy right now. Competing organizations are not the answer. So in this we rely in part on the very good cooperation with ASEAN countries under the UN, the WTO umbrella, and we already have it. The third point is that Norway must cooperate even more closely with like-minded countries and with not always so like-minded countries. In fact, confining ourselves solely to the like-minded countries will prevent us from finding common ground with many countries on areas where we need to. We can call it a bit of a lazy diplomacy if we only lean on like-minded countries. And this is the key. We have to work differently and seek new partnerships with countries where we don't always agree on everything. And let me give you one example. We have a record of being very opposed to the death penalty. We have always been that, and we have been advocating that for decades. That should not hinder us in cooperating with countries where they do have death penalty in order to try to find a way where countries can abolish the death penalty or have a moratorium on the death penalty, because we may need to find common ground with these countries in other areas. And I think that it is not enough anymore to think only Nordic, European or Western countries. It is not enough anymore in this region to only think Southeast Asia. You have to think broader in order to take care of your interests. Our fourth and fifth priorities are related to how the government works. And it's very, uh, I would say, in short, uh, we are talking about better internal coordination, that we need the experts, sufficient resources, and so forth. Our sixth priority is to cooperate more on issues of common interest with countries on other continents. That means that we have to intensify our partnerships in countries in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America. This is also why we have strengthened our cooperation with organizations like ASEAN, like the African Union, like CARICOM and the Pacific Alliance. Southeast Asia in particular stands out as a region which we have much in common. Like Norway, the ASEAN countries are located in a geographically important region. At least we always like to think that ourselves. Like Norway, ASEAN countries have in its vicinity bigger countries than themselves. And like Norway, ASEAN has demonstrated that international cooperation is key to security, stability and prosperity. And my message to the governments that I meet during my days here is that we must continue to stand shoulder to shoulder in preserving the building blocks of the multilateral system. It has served both Norway and ASEAN countries so well over the last decades. No, it's not perfect. No systems are perfect. But it is the best system we have to uphold our interests, both individually and global interests. The white paper is in its entirety available online in English at the Norwegian MFA's website and I do hope that it can be of interest to you. So in closing, I would once again like to say a warm thank you to the Institute for having me here today.
and I look forward to uh, the other comments from the previous four ministers and also to engage in a dialogue with you in the audience. Thank you very much.